I hit the jewel, I got some goals I sold a little weed, but I could never sell my soul And when I'm in LA, you find me all in a little coat Come up, woke up in my ramen, I'ma need another bowl, let's go Wow, so you're like all political Everything is political, Sean. Legalize nuclear bombs. <laughs> well, well, well. Here we are, uh, again. So after the overrated disaster that was Life is Strange 1, and the Deck 9 developed disaster prequel that was Before the Storm, Don't Nod, the original developers, came back for Life is Strange 2. Now, I had a lot of people telling me that Life is Strange 2 is the best in the series, and a massive step up from the rest of the games. However, I've also heard, um, divisive things about it, and because it's a Life is Strange game, I kinda went in with really low expectations. So I finished episode 1, Realized that I forgot to play Captain Spirit, finished that real quick, thought it fucking sucked, finished the rest of Life is Strange 2, watched a YouTube video on all the shit I missed, and man, I have some complex feelings, but we'll get there later. But despite my low expectations, I was still marginally curious. This game has a new cast of characters, and doesn't follow Max and Chloe, which in my eyes is a very good thing. But would these new characters be engaging? Would Don't Nod learn the mistakes from the first game? Would they incorporate more than two endings? Would the story not not be dog shit. Would I not hate every single character? I had all these questions going into the game. And then, uh, something weird happened. Because I almost liked this game. Yeah, I'm, uh, not kidding. I almost enjoyed a Life is Strange game. It wasn't a masterpiece or anything, but I could recommend it to a few people. And after the first two episodes, I was fully willing to give this game a 6 out of 10. But then, uh, Chapter 3 happened. And then the, uh, rest of the game happened. Here's the thing. Life is Strange 2 is the best game in the series. I liked it. But remember, that means it's the best game in the Life is Strange series. A series that so far has two, three out of ten games. And overall, this game is a five in my book. Despite massive improvements, this game also has a massive inconsistency issue. And by golly, I'm gonna talk about it. Real quick, I am playing the PC version. This game hasn't been remastered, which is really weird. Not that it needs one, but at least a Switch port. I played through Episode 1, then Captain Spirit, then the rest of the game. Captain Spirit, of course, being the free prequel spin-off about the Captain Spirit. And like before the storm, a lot of my opinions are from my first playthrough of the game. So I had about a week to form these opinions. So once again, I'm not gonna be as concise as the first game. But with all that out of the way, let's travel the open road and cross the border. I am never saying that again. Part one, the things that are better. Now, unlike before the storm, I actually have a lot to say here. First of all, the premise is better. So the game starts off with this really weird police tape where an officer is killed by a mysterious explosion. It's a lot more eerie and mysterious and really draws you in. But now it's time for the real story to begin. So in this game, the main character is Sean, a 16-year-old half-Mexican high schooler living in Seattle, living with his single dad and his nine-year-old brother, Daniel. We're also introduced to this girl and this dickhead of a neighbor. Hey, lovebirds. Shut the fuck up. What do you say? And at first I was like, oh great, this is gonna be the first game again, isn't it? You have the Chloe Price character, you have the dickhead Nathan type character, and for about 30 minutes it really feels like it's going in that direction. But then Sean's dad is shot and killed by the officer you saw in the intro. And it turns out the explosion from the intro is actually from Daniel, your little brother who has superpowers. So for the rest of the game, you and Daniel are running from the law. You have to teach Daniel to harness his psychokinesis powers and be a father figure to him while not really knowing how to survive yourself. And I like this premise a lot more. It feels like this game took inspirations from The Last of Us. Looks like it. Clicker. Okay, well, it isn't subtle about yeah. it. Okay, okay, I get it. Oh. In spite of the game's lack of subtlety, and while I still have problems with the game's writing, because trust me, uh, it ain't great. Do you think there are werewolves for real? Dude, we are the wolves. Oh! The whole Last of Us God of War thing of following a little child around and teaching them skills along the way may not be the most original concept, but I found it to be much more engaging, especially when the law is always one step behind you. I remember this one Life is Strange comment I got saying that I was stupid because I think games need nonstop action. Obviously, this is an extreme straw man and not true at all. But after getting much more engaged in Life is Strange 2's higher stakes concept, you could probably be able to fool some people because yeah, Life is Strange 2 has a bit more action and experience 
excitement in it. And I enjoyed it more. I don't know, maybe games do need more non-stop action. Ironically though, in the first two chapters, it's the slower, more intimate scenes with Sean and Daniel that I found to be really good. Also, I gotta give Sean some praise too. In my opinion, he is a way better character than Max Caulfield. Max was really bland, probably intentionally, but I just didn't find myself caring about her that much. However, I was much more engaged with the character of Sean. Sean is still a kid, 16 years old in fact, but with his dad now dead and that memory fresh in his head, he now has to be a father figure for Daniel. And you get the impression he doesn't quite know what he's doing. So Sean is always on the fine line between maturity and immaturity. Once again, the character is running from the law and living in the woods, so you have to choose between survival and morality. Choosing whether to break the law to keep yourself alive, or keeping your head down and being a good influence on Daniel. And depending on what you do, you can either influence him positively or negatively. Now this aspect isn't perfect, and I'll get to that later, but Sean and Daniel themselves, uh, they ate. The core of their interactions, I think, is fairly well done. And these quieter, more intimate moments are very heartwarming. Now, I don't think Sean is an amazing character or anything, and the way he's actually written is very hit or miss. His inner monologues can get really grating at points, and oftentimes he'll just state the obvious, you know, a AAA gaming dialogue. It's almost a problem with the genre where most of it is tell, don't show, but here it's kind of amplified. It's almost like that gothic remake demo from a couple years back, where the writers confuse charisma with constant nervous talking. Oh, fuck. Oh shit. Fuck. Oh fuck, my bag. What? Wow. Right. Great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, I'm okay, Nathan Drake. Yeah. But you know what? He gets the damn job done. He's a perfectly fine protagonist, and in my opinion, a very big step up from Max Caulfield. Overall, I think Sean is a perfectly fine protagonist. Now, I saw a couple people complain about the side characters in this game, and how they're not nearly as memorable as the ones in the first game. Now, of course, I hated everyone in the first game, so this wasn't exactly a problem for me. But, and this may sound kind of weird, but I kind of liked how quote-unquote less memorable these side characters were. This is for two reasons. First of all, it fits the point of the story. The two protagonists are trying to run to Mexico, so they can live prosperously in their father's old house. Of course, they're going to meet a lot of random people along the way, but you don't have time to sit and chat with them. For the first two chapters, instead of holding the story back like in the first game, the side characters are instead of pushing the story forward, and allowing that feeling of traveling the open road and meeting these alien people in these alien places. You get a new character every chapter, which leads to this sense of alienation, which is really fitting for the plot. The second reason I like them not being as memorable is because they don't lose focus of the story. For the first two episodes, they aren't invasive at all. This allows focus to be where focus needs to be, on Sean and Daniel and their relationship. The side characters add on to that, but they don't ever take away from it for the first two episodes. There's clearly a bigger emphasis on this game being more artistic, I guess. The biggest example for me being the way the game recaps previous episodes. So in the first two games, when you began a new episode, it would recap the previous one like a TV show. Previously on Life is Strange Before the Storm. <laughs> There wasn't much to criticize or anything because they got the job done, but they were really tacky and reminded me of that shitty Alone in the Dark reboot from 2008. Is what I would say if that game wasn't a masterpiece. Previously on Alone in the Dark. Now give me my stone! I don't have your stone, and fuck you anyway! In Life is Strange 2, however, the story is recapped very interestingly, being presented as a story about two wolves that Sean is telling to Daniel, with each animal representing a certain character. A little pretentious, but it is really creative, and a far cry from generic Degrassi knockoff. Once upon a time, in a wild, wild world, there were two wolf brothers. What exactly is a furry, and how do you know if you are one? Hey everyone! My name is Gustavo, but you can call me Gus. Finally, I said to myself, this is a massive improvement. This is what I'm talking about. A story that isn't convoluted or anything. The main two characters are relatively likable and have good chemistry. Daniel's a little annoying, but he's a nine-year-old kid, so it's okay. The side characters add to the atmosphere and themes and push the story forward. And hell, even the graphics are better. The facial animations are kinda stiff, but the animations, especially when Sean is in movement, are really good. And the lighting and environments are way better. It's a lot more clear what is and isn't 
isn't an artistic choice in this game. This is in contrast to the last two games, which, and I didn't mention this, because I didn't know if it was a budgetary problem or not, but I don't like how those games look. All the textures are disgustingly blurry. The animations are a hella stiff. The game is literally graphically on par with fucking Half-Life 2, but this game just looks so much better. It goes to show what higher fidelity can really bring to a game. Not to say it's perfect, of course. Some textures look, yeah, not the best. Again, the faces look kinda stiff, and there's this fuck ugly motion blur that you can't turn off without going into an any file. What? Why? Nobody in the fucking universe likes motion blur. I shouldn't have to hack the fucking Pentagon to turn off motion blur. So while there are some problems, this is so far not that bad. There's no possible way they can fuck this up. Part two, the stuff I'm mixed about, how they fuck it up. Okay, well, not completely fuck it up. That will be saved for oh. later. But this is just in general stuff I'm so far mixed about in the first two episodes. The stuff that's not a horrible, but not great either. So in the first game, I hated the dialogue and the writing. Just absolute garbage. And I've got to say, in all honesty, um... Photo bomb! Photo hog. It's the biggest piece of dog shit that I have ever heard. Characters are just spouting slang in pop culture terms. And not only is it unrealistic, it also gets really annoying really fast. So how is Life is Strange 2? Well, I will say this, it's not as bad as the original game. It should change us so fast. I get so emo Okay, sometimes. never mind. Thankfully, this cringy dialogue is a lot less frequent, and for the most part, the game understands that humans have to talk like humans. However, while the writing is better, I can't really call it good. It still tends to be way too wistful at points, making characters seem way too overdramatic, as if the game is trying way too hard to be emotional. There are some genuinely good dialogue exchanges in this game, but there's also just really bad ones. And of course, we must not forget the booze. What up? The booze. What is it? Get the fuck out of the pro! This is a birthday card for my little sister. Hey, since you're such a pro big bro, what's a good way to end this letter? Well, what is she into? Like, anime or... Man, if you don't cut that shit out. So unlike the first game, where all the dialogue is all bad all the time, the sequel is much more hit or miss. Which may be an improvement from the first game, but to quote a wise captain... That was an improvement, but it's not hard to improve on garbage. Here's another thing. I said earlier I like how the side characters are handled in the story. However, while I like their placement in the story, I have problems with the characters themselves. Quite a few of them, especially later in the game, are just straight up garbage. The hippie characters in episode 3 are a prime example example of this. So at the end of chapter 2, you meet some hippie characters, and in episode 3, you end up living with them. In fact, the entirety of episode 3 is pretty much about them, which firstly, I felt really halted the progression between Sean and Daniel, and ruined the forward-moving momentum the story had in the first two episodes. But the bigger issue is that these characters are just so fucking boring. They take the story way off track, but it's really not worth it at all, because I really don't find these characters engaging. And this is a problem with the second half of the game. Entire episodes are dedicated to these side characters who don't have the depth to compensate or justify an entire episode. And thankfully, these characters never quite reach the lows of, say, Chloe Price, but Don't Not still haven't fully learned their lesson about bad side characters. Which sucks because for the first two chapters, I thought they almost did. Another thing that's really mixed is the choice system. I'll get to how certain choices affect the endings later, but what I do like is this. The game is dependent on you being a good role model to Daniel, and this actually affects him throughout the story. Finally, your choices matter. It only took two fucking games, except actually, uh, not really, because your choices literally only affect the ending and nothing else in the story, and all of them will lead you to the exact same outcome. The story never really changes at all, not until the last minute anyways. I understand these kinds of games aren't easy to make, but it still feels like for a good majority of the story, your actions don't truly affect the narrative. They affect certain events in the narrative, but those events would have just ended there anyways. Take for example, Captain Spirit. At the end of chapter 2, Daniel before friends him, and he can either avoid getting hit by a car, help you escape, or get hit by a car. I don't have your stone, and fuck you anyway. But it really doesn't matter because this is where his character ends. The next time you see him is in a JPEG in one of the endings. Once again, this specific event may change, but the story never does. It's the same problem the original game had, and Don't Nod didn't really learn their lesson. Yes, the choices in the game are a lot better, but I wouldn't call them good or even really impactful. Overall, in spite of multiple improvements, the game is still far from ideal. But the flaws I listed are what I would call double-edged swords. They definitely hinder the experience, but don't outright 
they'd ruin it. In other words, they don't entirely fuck up the game. So now here's the shit that does fuck up the entire game. Part three, Captain Spirit is garbage. Before we talk about the actual game, let's talk about the free spinoff Captain Spirit and how much it sucks. So right before Life is Strange 2 came out, Dota released this free little game. That's essentially a one hour backstory for Captain Spirit, who, like I said earlier, is a character who appears for one chapter. This game was made as one big commercial and it really feels like it. You follow Captain Spirit, or Chris. He's a little kid who lives with a single dad and role plays as Captain Spirit, a superhero he made up in his backyard. Now, when I first heard of this game and heard that it was a quote unquote emotional experience, I thought to myself, okay, judging what Donut has done and hasn't done so far, either the kid lost his mom and that's the big emotional moment or the mom left the family and the dad is an abusive prick. Turns out after playing it, um, both were right. Captain Spirit's mom died and that's why he's Captain Spirit to cope and seethe with it all. But it's also the reason his dad is a drunk, alcoholic, abusive piece of shit. Captain Spirit also has an arch nemesis named Mantroid and he got the name Mantroid from the two streets his mom died on in an intersection. Of course, these themes are never properly explored. And just when you think it is, Captain Spirit ends with a sequel bait teaser ending. That's it? It feels like a cheap emotional bait and switch. Oh, you thought this would be a cute game, huh? Well, it's actually about abuse and death that we use to promote our second game that you should buy right now. Furthermore, when chapter two ends, that's once again where Captain Spirit's entire character ends. He's still living with his dad, at least if you choose the ending where he lives. So he just kind of goes with the abuse? Wow, what a great moral. Just deal with your abuse. This isn't really even explored in Life is Strange 2 anyway. You have to get Chris to open up about it, which I get it, the story he's not about him. Well, then why did you make an entire prequel about him? And if he dies, well, that's even worse. So you made this nine-year-old kid character who lost his mom and gets beat by his drunk dad, only for you to cheaply kill him off. What the fuck is wrong with you, don't not? And Captain Spirit literally ends with his dad blaming him for his wife's death, and then Life is Strange 2 Episode 2 happens like nothing fucking happened. Jesus, stop that whining. What the fuck did you just say to me? You're not a baby anymore. Oh, boo-hoo, daddy. Grow up. Try me, you fucking weasel! Even when you do confront Chris's dad about this, he just kinda goes, yeah, I'm a horrible person, I'll work on it. Well, are you going to? Don't nod. You do realize that this is bad, right? This isn't respectful to abuse victims or anything. You're not doing anything positive by writing shit like this. You're just using incredibly dark subject matter to create cheap emotional drama that doesn't go anywhere anyway. On top of using that to market another video game you have to buy. God of fucking damn it, it's Kate Mar- Marsh all over again. It's just really distasteful. If Dota just followed through on these themes and gave this shit proper resolution, this wouldn't be nearly as much of a problem. But it is, and that's really just awful. Dota really should be ashamed of themselves for this. You gotta be ashamed of yourself. Real talk. Part 4, chapters 3 through 5 are garbage. Now, up to this point, you may have noticed something. A lot of the positives I said are given a big disclaimer. That disclaimer being for the first two chapters. Because for the first two chapters, the game is indeed a 6 out of 10. It's certainly nowhere near perfect, and I wasn't ready to call it good yet. But like I said earlier, there are plenty of good elements in here. And if the game just coasted along like it was, I wouldn't really have a problem with it. However, at the end of chapter 2 and beginning in chapter 3, the game just absolutely nosedives in quality, with chapter 3 being an absolute snore fest, chapter 4 being absolute what? dog shit, and chapter 5 being slightly better but not great at all, and it's ultimately too little too late. But firstly, chapter 3. So at the end of chapter 2, you meet Cassidy and Finn, who are two hippies living out in the woods. In chapter 3, you then end up living with all the hippies, and you do stuff like cut weed. To put it in other words, you ain't got no weed! I said earlier in the video that I think all these characters are really boring. They do indeed have backstories, and I guess that's commendable. But they also don't really do anything. And once again, most of them really only exist in this one episode. So you get less of a reason to learn or care about them. All on top of them already being really underwritten characters. You literally meet one of them for the first time topless. Cassidy is probably the second most important character out of these hippies. But she's still pretty uninteresting. And she feels like nothing more than a sex object for you to romance. Maybe this works in like mass 
Mass Effect, but not in this game at all. And because she doesn't really carry over into the rest of the story, not to mention the chapter ends the exact same way no matter what happens, with you getting caught in a heist and the building blowing up and you losing your eye, pretty much anything else she can do is superficial. You can literally make her hate you in chapter 3, only for her to send you a nice letter in the next episode no matter what happens. And this is the equivalent to the theater scene in Before the Storm. It's very not good. The most important character in this chapter out of the hippies is Finn. But not only is he again really boring and a pretty forgettable personality wise, but he also helps to distract the story from where I think the focus should have been. Daniel almost becomes a really minor side character and Finn becomes a lot more prominent. I get what they're trying to do. Sean hasn't been around cool people his age for a while and he looks up to these hippie characters and wants to spend time with them. But Daniel gets jealous and that it hurts that Sean and Daniel's relationship. You're always with them! Bet you don't even want me around anymore. However, what ultimately ends up happening is the feeling of the story losing focus. Yeah, I get the idea behind it, but now that good story of Sean and Daniel growing together is kind of being minimized for cheap drama, I feel. It once again just feels really inconsistent. And not to mention, Daniel comes off as really spoiled and just really ungrateful. Just a massive backstep for the character. Once again, I get the attempt here, but I wish they chose something better. There is one scene, however, that I like in this chapter, and that's this campfire scene. Where the characters sit around and talk about the worst moments in their lives. And while not award-winning, it's pretty well-written, Sean and Daniel are still coping from the loss of their dad. So this one scene of all the hippies sitting around, having this makeshift group therapy session is just so heartwarming. And it feels like the most natural progression of the story's theme. I think this is what the chapter should have been about. It should have been more introspective. In an otherwise really mediocre chapter, this scene really stands out. It really sucks that Don't Nod couldn't put away the contrivances for a minute, because there truly is something Something here. Too bad, uh, they fuck it up in chapter 4. And this is where shit gets really fucky. Almost all of this chapter is dedicated to this cult. A cult that for one episode indoctrinates Daniel into it. And who the cult leader uses to further her power. And all of this is out of complete left field. Religion is not a major talking point until literally now. And as soon as the episode ends, that's it. All the characters act like it never fucking happened. This chapter just feels really pointless. All the people in the cult feel like stereotypical bad guys guys. Just the most obvious example of bad religious figure you can think of. They don't feel like actual religious scumbags, but more so a, a Far Cry 5 type portrayal. In fact, I think Far Cry 5 might be more realistic than Life is Strange 2. What's the lesson I'm supposed to learn? That cults are bad? I already fucking know this! He spoke to me and told me that I was doing right. And the Lord told me that I love voicemail. Oh God, I love voicemail. I'm stroking my dick. This is an extremely basic criticism of religion. And it's not that you can't criticize religion at all. There are quite a few works that I think do it way better. And of course, you should be allowed to criticize religion. But this is that lazy emo the musical type criticism. Wow, that's a movie I have not thought about in a while. It's the same shit you heard before, just packaged differently. It also has literally nothing to do with anything. Once again, religion isn't a topic until now. What's even more weird is that Life is Strange is an overtly more political game, dealing with themes of racism and xenophobia. But the cult isn't even racist, they're just kinda crazy. It's like Don't Nod didn't know what else to do with this story. So they wrote in this really lazy Christian criticism into the story. It just feels like it has nothing to do with anything at all. A society. Oh, and don't even get me started on the worst character in the story. Sean and Daniel's mother. This fucking mistake of a character and plot point. She's pretty much the face of everything wrong with Don't Nod's writing style. So early on in the game, it's known that Sean and Daniel's mother left the family. So there's a lot of animosity towards her. To the point where their grandparents barely even consider her their daughter anymore. But then out of nowhere in episode 4, oh shit, she's here! Conveniently at the same time when Sean's trying to free Daniel from the cult. Deus Ex Machina-ing herself into the plot. Okay, so her insertion is a little sloppy. But Honestly, that's the least of her problems. So get this, the reason she left Sean and Daniel's family, and the reason she put everyone else into turmoil, is because she got tired of being a mom and wanted to be free. Why did you bail on us? I wasn't meant to be a wife, or a mother. I thought I was supposed to. I tried to pretend for many years, but I was unhappy, and the urge to leave just became unbearable. I had no other choice. Are you serious? You chose this life. You fell in love. You made your own choices. Making your own choices doesn't mean you can never 
fool yourself. Shall what does that mean? Also, judging by the condoms in her bag, this woman belongs in the fucking street. And yet, and here's the crazy part, you're supposed to sympathize with her. You're supposed to forgive her on principle and feel bad for her, but I genuinely can't. Not when her reasoning for leaving is, I got too lazy to be a mom. And you're not truly allowed to dislike her either. And trust me, I fucking tried. You're forced to work with her and to some extent accept her as your mom. But you can't truly call her out on her bullshit. Nor are you given a good reason to forgive. Her. It's the same problem a character like Chloe Price had, where she does a whole bunch of terrible shit to you, but you can't truly call her out on her bullshit, nor does the character go through any significant arcs. Furthermore, once again, this is an example of a plot point that further convolutes the story. What could have been a story about Sean and Daniel finding their own family within themselves, suddenly gets the Star Wars ass extra family member thrown in. This is just a really sloppily put together character. Don't nod, genuinely could not help themselves. The whole mom issue carries over in a chapter 5. It's not really fixed, more so it's ended. Most of the chapter is dicking around in this rock civilization, albeit with some wholesome moments in it. The Sean and Daniel chemistry is back on track. It is admittedly fun and heartwarming to play a hot and cold and build structures with Daniel. It makes the past two chapters feel even more like filler. I want to bond with Daniel. I want to do this shit. I don't want to hang with hippies or fight a church cult or talk to my missing mom. The problem with chapter 5 is it makes the past two chapters look worse. It has all the stuff I want from the game, all the stuff chapters 1 and 2 promise, and yet the game just kind of goes on pause for two chapters. The game loses focus and adds a lot of fluff to the story, but it's fluff that isn't nearly as interesting as the game thinks it is. The game is very obviously inspired by The Last of Us, Let's go golfing. but even though Joel and Ellie weren't exactly the best of friends starting off, and while they did fight throughout the story, the game still had a forward moving momentum. The game was focused on Joel and Ellie. There were side characters, but they didn't distract from the story. If anything, they added to it. Life is Strange 2 doesn't really do that, however, which is a damn shame because if it did, this could have been a pretty decent experience. Oh, before I end this segment, uh, David's also in Chapter 5. He's voiced by the shitty Before the Storm voice actor for some reason, and after the death of Chloe and or Arcadia Bay, he's now living in the rocks, and pretty much 180'd on his hyper-aggressive personality. It's weird seeing him so out of character, but it makes sense at least. But still, his inclusion feels like it's more there for a quick reference, because he really doesn't do anything. I kinda wish they did a little bit more with his character. David was one of the few not completely dog shit parts of the first game, and I wish they kind of continued that here. Overall, this part of the game is just really frustrating. Don't nod can't write anything good to save their lives. Man, I'm gonna... I'm gonna break my monitor, I swear! Part 5, Political. Oh great, a reason for people to get mad at me now. Now, a quick disclaimer, I don't have a problem with Life is Strange 2 being political, or even what it's trying to say. In fact, contextually, it makes quite a bit of sense. So yeah, Life is Strange 2 is a much more political game this time around. The first game touched on politics, in the same way that political YouTubers touch on not making me want to shove a shotgun down my throat and blow my fucking brains out. Sam Hyde calls out Hassan with a that, bizarre box. I'm going to end the problem really is on the people who are yelling at Sam Hyde about the problem. But now, Life is Strange 2 is actually political, discussing themes of immigration, xenophobia, and racism. Now, this is not a bad thing on its own, and I cannot stress enough, my problem is not with the themes themselves. The issue, however, is that how the themes are handled is just not very good. Uh, actually, um... It was horrible. You'll meet these racist characters throughout the game. And not that this in itself is the problem. However, the issue is that they're written like this. Sing something. <laughs> it's so fucking goofy! Dodna just can't do subtlety or nuance correctly. So when they try to write a sad scene where Sean gets bullied by a racist, and it's meant to be a really sad scene, it's immediately ruined when they decide to have Sean sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Dodna, known for forcing dead memes into their works. That was an epic win. That's what the kids call epic fail. Were somehow unable to stop themselves in the face of these serious topics. You're the reason we need to build that wall. Shut your ass up. <laughs> The politics serve less to give the story a sense of finality or deeper meaning, and instead almost halt the story's immersion and pacing. Like, once again, this is really sloppy stuff, and can even be unnecessary at certain points. For example, near the end of the game, Sean meets these two racists at the border, and ends up getting arrested, meeting these two illegal immigrants in his jail cell. And they give this entire expository dialogue on why they're trying to get to the US, but yet, you already had that with Sean and Daniel. You had an entire game with these two characters with the exact same thing 
themes that can easily show you the perspective of why someone would want to immigrate to somewhere else. And furthermore, these two characters only exist in this scene here. They're essentially only here to say that xenophobia is bad, which once again is not a bad theme. It's just that this breaks the rule of show don't tell. This is like a fucking David Cage move. Leave her alone! Leave her alone! Show me this guy's balls, please. It really sucks because if the game did play to its strengths, these could have been relatively decent themes in the game. These issues could have pushed the story forward, give greater narrative depth. Hopefully you get what I'm saying here. The themes of anti-xenophobia are not themselves bad by any means, but the game is shit at expressing them. I can't take them seriously. They cannibalize the story. It's this really weird, somewhat small thing that just really hurts the story. These aspects needed more time in the oven. Anyways, I'm gonna move on before some political channel makes it fun video on me. Why are you boring me? I'm right. Part 6, the ending. So after the shit endings of the other games, and after being told Life is Strange 2 has seven whole endings, this got me optimistic about the endings of the game. So I beat the game and- So that was a fucking lie. So there aren't actually seven endings in the game. In reality, there are four endings, but two of them have a couple of variants. In one ending, you can get the girl from the beginning of the game to show up in the background somewhere. And in the other one, if you romance Cassidy or Finn, you can get a JPEG of them at the end of the game. So yeah, yeah, there aren't actually seven endings, but rather four, which are still tied to your last minute choices at the end of the game, like but they're also dependent on Daniel's morality and how you taught him throughout the game. And depending on what you taught him and what choices you make, he'll either obey you or disobey you. I got the ending where Daniel uses his powers to help Sean escape to Mexico and the two of them start their own car garage. There's one ending where you two turn yourselves in and Sean and Daniel reunite years later. There's one ending where Daniel refuses to surrender and tries to force himself into Mexico, but gets Sean killed in the process and ends up living in Mexico. Mexico by himself. And then there's the ending where Sean escapes to Mexico. But Daniel jumps out of the car at the last minute, turning himself in. I'm a villain, not a monster. And yeah, I thought, unlike the first game, which is a lazy fucking cop-out, this is better. And while not perfect, this is, initially, an improvement. There are both more endings and more dynamic choices. So these are good endings, right? Uh, no, they're not. The problem is with the endings themselves. So the climactic border fight scene is pretty good. Because as we all know, games need action because they're not good otherwise. But then, after this scene, you get a completely quiet AMV ending. There are no sound in these. Not even a generic monologue. These endings are completely completely mute. This makes these endings feel very awkward and rushed, and not to mention really anticlimactic. The issue is that none of these endings really cap off the game in a meaningful way. None of the themes or personal character threads feel truly resolved, and you're kind of left sitting there going, that's it? That's all the game has to offer? You have all these political themes and characters, all this personal shit between Sean and Daniel, and this is how you choose to game. end it? I really don't think it would have hurt to add an extra dialogue exchange, it's just something that adds a sense of finality to these endings. Endings. Nothing feels satisfying or anything. Yes, there are more endings. And they're better implemented endings. But the endings themselves aren't good endings. It's almost an allegory for my thoughts on the game as a whole. It's an improvement, but it ain't exactly good. Which in that case, maybe these are the perfect endings. And these should have had more time in the oven. These feel super rushed. Better luck next time, I guess. Part 7, Conclusion. Man, this just makes me sad. Because believe it or not, a part of me wants to like this. Life is Strange 2 is genuinely an improvement over the first game. The thing is, while there are indeed improvements to the game, the complete nosedive in quality just hurts this game. What starts off as a really promising first two episodes ends up being a complete oh, mixed wow. bag. From the inconsistent and pointless plot threads, to some of these horrible and or boring characters, to the really poorly implemented political themes, on top of the Life is Strange-ism dialogue still being there, it's just really inconsistent. This is indeed the best Life is Strange game, but even then it's nothing more than it's not that bad. Which honestly is not enough to turn me around on this series. I don't know, maybe someone will enjoy this more than me. But in the end, this was to me a 5 out of 10 experience. Last time I recommended Night in the Woods over the original game. In this case, I recommend God of War. That game tackles a very similar story. You got this kid who's really special and grows to be a snobby brat. You have Kratos who has to teach him how to behave. They also lost an important family figure at the beginning of the game. But in Life is Strange 2, a lot of the drama feels contrived. While in God of War, the drama feels like very meticulous and intentional decision making. Where the drama comes from not just trying to include characters bickering or something, but also trying to fully flesh out these characters. Atreus needs to learn maturity and restraint. Kratos has to get over his grief and his past and his guilt. By the end of God of War 2018, I was genuinely tearing up. All the many endings of Life is Strange 2 made me go, that's it? <laughs> Overall, check it out if you can. It's one of my favorite games of all time. In conclusion, Life is Strange 2 is a mixed bag, but I almost liked it. It's a shame the game wouldn't stop cannibalizing itself. Because 
because if it didn't, maybe it would have been something special. Oh, and uh, Chloe wasn't in it, so uh, it's actually a 10. up to get to the cherry on the top got it oh in the mouth it was lovely then onto the ice cream mm, and the chocolate sauce <laughs> dig in that was a, a bit rich but okay then there was some um, jelly stuff and actually um, that wasn't very nice uh, actually um, it was horrible now I was filling my cheeks so as not to taste it so much. Then I got to the trifle, soggy cake. And that was even more horrible. I couldn't bear to put it in my mouth. I couldn't even put it in my cheeks. I hunched my shoulders and <laughs> spat some onto my plate. I don't like it very much. 